So we were discussing uh, current mirrors. Okay, so we were discussing current mirrors, and obviously the discussion makes sense if we include channel length modulation. Without channel length modulation, we don't need the transistor on top because uh, the impedance of M1 would have an infinity. The reason we have the transistor on top, the reason we have the transistor on top that is M2 is essentially to shield M2. So if V0 changes by a certain amount, we don't want we don't want the drain of M1 to change by using the So we put a dashboard transistor on the top to ensure that the screen at the drain of M1 is, is minimal. Okay. So, so this we have discussed ex extension extensively. So now let's get get to uh, now let's get to the properties of the current meter or the properties of a Properties of a control current source, which we expect from this from this configuration. So let's say this is V naught, which is being fed by something else, right? V naught is not a not a not VDD or not a source. Okay, so so what are the two things that we are expecting? The two things that we are expecting from this is. Get rid of this. Post in the back and you come in front. What is I can't cover. Okay, so am I audible in the back? I presume not. Please come come in front. Okay, so the expectation is uh I want should be equal to I naught. That is number one. And number two is this is under this is let's say under percent. And the second expectation is even if V naught changes, so this is delta i, let's say, and this is delta v, delta v naught. So delta i should be almost equal to zero if delta v naught is finite. Right? So essentially, what we are trying to do, we are trying to mimic a good current source. Right? A current source is something where even if the voltage across the current source changes, the current doesn't. Change. In other words, what we are expecting is even if, if we have in this case a voltage across this current source, we can get the change in V naught. If V naught changes, I don't expect any change of current, right? But I mean, uh, it's not a real current source, so obviously there will be something. So it, as long as delta is approximately equal to zero, what is approximate uh, depends on applications. But as long as delta i is approximately equal to zero or much lesser than a single transistor case, we are good, right? So in this case, uh, this this if we attack the second part first, so now it should be pretty obvious. Can you tell me if V naught changes by delta V, what will be delta, what will be delta I? What is that R? Right, so so delta i will be delta v naught over r equivalent. What will be the r equivalent in the presence of channel and modulation? Which means that this has r ds one. This is r ds two. 
So R equivalent is one of the quiz questions, RDS1 plus RDS2 plus the intrinsic gain of M2, that is GM2 times RDS2 times RDS1. Right? So now, had this configuration not been there, had if you only had M1, if you only had M1, then only the argument would have been RDS1. So putting that Casco transistor on top, effectively has increased the output impedance. And we have explored this multiple times. And not uh, it has in increased the output impedance not only by the seat, by the RDSs of two transistors, not as the output impedance went from RDS1 to RDS1 plus RDS1. It went up by significant factor, and that factor is this. OK, and if uh, and if that is as it turns out, if the transistor is biased in saturation, the third term essentially is a dominant term, right? So essentially, you see, uh, this cascoded configuration helps in helps in making a better current source, and by a big factor of the factor is essentially the gain of the gain of the casco transistor, intrinsic gain of the casco transistor. Okay, so this is good. I mean, so looks like by simply putting a transistor on top and ensuring that both transistors are biased in saturation, we should be able to make a better current source. And we can go crazy or wrong. So you can put another casco, another transistor on top. And we keep on doing this. For example, we can we can say that. So let's say let's take some numbers. Let's say RDS one was ten kilo ohm, and for some reason this is not acceptable. Uh, and if GM times RDS, that is the intrinsic gain of a transistor, is let's say of the order of ten, then I can say that this is ten times ten kilo ohm, and this is another ten kilo ohm. So you see that your R equivalent goes from ten kilo ohm to like. 120 kilo ohm by just putting a transistor on top. And similarly, I can do that. I can stack another transistor on top. If this is 120 kilo ohm is also not good enough. If it's not good enough, we can do this. This becomes V0. I can say this is VB2. This is VB3. This is And we can keep keep doing this, right? So if we have to analyze this, what will be the output impedance? How should I go about doing it? I want to find out the output impedance from here. So what, what is the strategy? How will I go about doing it? I don't want to write all of our KCL details again. So what I do is I will see that this look, impedance looking down is RDS1. This impedance looking down is the one that we just figured out, right? So this, let's say R equivalent two is RDS one plus RDS two plus the intrinsic gain of M two times RDS one. So so this becomes the R equivalent. So looking from the top, that is R equivalent three will be. RDS3 plus whatever R equivalent to plus the intrinsic gain of the three times R equivalent to. And if we only take R equivalent to will be only this and your R equivalent three will only be this, right? So as you see, when you can go crazy and you can keep on putting one transistor on top of each other, and you will get very good output impedances. But this comes at a cost, and we'll discuss the cost uh, as we go ahead. Hopefully by the end of today's lecture, if not uh, in, uh, in tomorrow's lecture. Okay. So, uh, so this, so increasing output impedance is easy. So that's that uh, that solves that kind of addresses the point number two. Or what about point number one? So let's look at point number one also.
So, in order to ensure that the, uh, that the current in both branches are identical, two conditions need to be satisfied. One is the VGS has to be same, right? And the other is the VDS also has to be same. The drain to source voltage also needs to be same. Okay, so which means that this VD1 also needs to be is equal, not, needs to be equal to needs to needs to be equal to what? VGS, right? VGS of M0 and M1. Okay, but now now again just a just to ensure that we are all on the same page. Who sets the value of VD1? M2, right? So if I have to raise VD1, what should I do? <coughs> increase VD2, right? If I have to increase VD1, I have to increase VD2 because we have again argued multiple times. Since the current is being set by M1 on the right hand side stack, whatever you do to VD2 should not change the current, right? Since it should not change the current, this means the VGS of M2 should remain constant, right? Ignoring channel modulation, it should be uh, it should remain constant. So, which means that if I increase VD2, VD1 is also also increased, right? So, so as a designer, if I need to increase VD1, I have to increase VD2. If I need to decrease VD1, I have to decrease VD2, right? So, so that that's a handle, right? So we can use that handle. So now, assuming that we need so, so to ensure, so, so this is, if I1 has to be equal to I0, then naturally we need to ensure VD1 is equal to VGS1, right? In other words, what I'm saying is, I do not have a direct control on VD1. I have to set VD1 indirect. And the indirect handle that I have is the is VD2. Right? So if that is that is the indirect handle that I have, then I need to set the value of VD2 in such a way that VD1 is exactly equal to VGS1. So what is that value of VD2 that I am looking for? Or the expression. In terms of special voltage, in terms of EGS, you can, you can, yes. You can talk about it in any way you can. <laughs> Comments? Yeah, right. Exactly. Right. So, so essentially, see, I, we know what we want. We want VG, VD1 to be equal to VGS1. So all we have to, if I have to set this value, the only handle we have is VB2 and VB2 has to be, is it equal to VD1 plus one VGS, right? Of, of VGS of M2, right? So if I know this voltage, if I know this voltage, this voltage has to be one VGS above the gate voltage has to be one VGS above the delta, above VD1. Okay. So, so I mean, this is quite obvious, but the thing that is uh, that will follow is how do I how do I generate this? How do I generate this VGS2? Right? So, so if everything works, this becomes VGS1 plus VGS2. So this VB2 has to be equal to VGS1 plus VGS2. Okay, so it is our job to manufacture a voltage VB2 which is equal to sum of VGS1 and VGS2. So now one way to go about doing it is to say that I'll I'll do the math, I'll get a value. Let's say for some the value comes out to be two volt, right? So I will manufacture a voltage resistive divider, get two volt out of it, and connect it at VGS at VB2. Right? It's quite possible. What I mean is, 
I will manufacture a resistive divider from a voltage supply and I will calculate it. I will find out these values of R1, R2 in such a way that VB2 becomes equal to this value. Right? So that is, that, that can be done. But the issue is VDS1 and VDS2, right? These are functions of petrol voltages. Right? So ultimately, your VGS1 is one threshold voltage plus V overdrive, right? So threshold voltage is a function of temperature. V overdrive is a function of mobility, which is again a function of temperature. So these values are going to change as the temperature changes, right? So, but but if I, if I manufacture this voltage using a resistive divider, then that voltage is not going to change. Right? As long as two resistors are very close by and they move in unison, that voltage is not going to change. Right? It is always be a uh, be whatever you initially calculated to be, or whatever ball fire frame uh, it will settle at. So then you might be able to find out that magic voltage that you need uh, by doing this calculation and setting the resistive divider, but that will be true for only one particular temperature. So it's not going to track any change. Right, so one of the which means the circuit will not be very will not behave optimally across temperatures. Right, so might be might be behaving optimally in summer, not in winter, might be in Kanpur, not in Chennai, and so on. Right, so this type of things can happen. So we don't want such things to happen. I mean, we know how how messy things can be if your devices don't work across temperature and across geographies. So which essentially means that we have to figure out a way of manufacturing VB2 not by resistive divider. But by using transistors, because if I if we only use, uh, if we only find out, if we only uh, manufacture DB2 using transistors, then the and and the transistors are set in such a way that their uh, their threshold voltages move in the same direction as the threshold voltages of all the other transistors in the in the in the circuit. Then the, the value of DB2 can adjust itself. Right, so we have been doing this auto adjusting based circuits for a while. So this, what I'm essentially asking you is to think, what can we do to generate this value of VB2 so that that VB2 is moving up and down with respect to the temperature as the need for it. Okay, so so one way to uh, so if I ask you that, if I ask you, how do I generate not VGS1 plus VGS2. How do I generate VGS1? Could be pretty straightforward. It's staring at our face. How do I generate VGS1? Yeah, right. So this VGS1 is already generated, right? The VGS1 is already generated, and this VGS1 is can move up and down with temperature, right? Because VGS1 is one threshold voltage. Plus overdrive. Okay. So, but I need VDS1 plus VDS2. And I want to generate it in the same manner that the way I have generated VDS1. Because if I generate it in this manner, then it is possible that the, with the change in threshold voltage, that values will also move up and down as we want. Okay. So, does that make sense? Okay. So, so let's break the circuit down. So we want we we know how to generate VGS one, which is one threshold voltage plus V overdrive. So can you suggest a way to generate, let's say, VGS one plus VGS two? But why is VGS one? So let me give you a hint. Yes, one is obviously by changing the W by L of this transistor, right? If I change the W by L of this transistor, then uh, then it's possible to raise, it's possible to change this VGS1 to, to a different value, right? So that is done, but there is an issue with that. I'll come back to that issue maybe one, one lecture after today, right? Uh, but that concept will be used to uh, increase the changing the W by L to change the VGS one. That concept will be used to. 
But if I try, if I am trying to explore another way of generating VGS one plus VGS two, then I can I can look at this and and think think of it in this way, right? So this voltage VGS one is essentially, or rather, this voltage. Let's say I call this you know V some VB. So this voltage VB is VGS one above the source voltage, right? So if the source is not grounded, let's say this is VS1. Okay. So VP will be equal to VS1 plus VGS1. Right? So this, this should be pretty simple. So now from this, can you can you come up with an idea that can you come up with a solution? So that GP becomes VGS1, VGS1 plus VGS2. So we understand that this current is I0. And if I do this, this voltage will be, let's say I call this, I just, okay, so let's, let's call this VGS2. So this voltage becomes VGS2. So which means this voltage is VGS2 which means this becomes v VGS2 plus VGS1. Okay. And VGS2 plus VGS1, this has been generated not by resistance divider, but by putting two transistors, which essentially means that as the threshold voltage is changed, VGS1 or plus VGS2, or in this case, GB can change in unison going up and down in the, in the same way as we want, right? So, so what does our overall circuit get modified to. So right hand side part remains the same. So they call it M08. And there is, I mean, the way I sketch this, uh, I, ideally this, this bottom one should be VGS1, the top one should be VGS2, because that's how we have named it. So, so let me call this VGS1, and let me call this VGS2. And the constraint here is the, the thing that we have to ensure is obviously M0 is equal to M1. W by L of M0 is identical to M1. Otherwise, there is no hope for this currents to be identical. But if we, since we want this VGS2 of M0A should be equal to the VGS2 of or VGS of M2, which, which means that we expect the, the, the sizing should be such that M0A should be identical to M2, right? Otherwise, uh, for the same current, we'll be generating a different VGS, right? Okay, fine. Any questions till now? Okay, so uh, so are you convinced that this this voltage here will be equal to VGS one? It should be right because ultimately. So 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 let's say. I, you, you see the circuit for the first time. How will you go about analyzing it, right? If, if I to get this circuit and I ask you, what is this voltage here? What is this voltage here? So what will be your thought? How will you go about thinking about it? Start writing KCL, KCL, and see what comes out, or that is the method. So there is a method, and the method is to first take a minute to understand. Who is setting that voltage? Right? So, so if we understand that this is a casco transistor, in a casco transistor, and assuming M1 is in saturation, this current is being set by M1, which means that we cannot affect that voltage by giving anything to M1, right? The only way we can affect that voltage is by is by changing this voltage, which means that I have to figure out who is setting that voltage, right? 
who is setting that voltage? How do I go about figuring it out? I understand that this voltage is equal to one VGS of this and one VGS of that, right? So, so you start from then, you start from here, you start from ground, then you say that this voltage is one VGS above ground, this voltage is two VGS above ground, and then this voltage is one VGS minus whatever I had to right? So, so essentially the way I would go about it is to say that this voltage is VGS one, this voltage is VGS two plus VGS one, and you have a drop of VGS two here. So this voltage becomes VGS one. Okay. So, so this, you don't even need pen and paper, right? You can simply, uh, uh, simply look at it and, uh, and argue. Okay. Uh, so, so far so good, but this circuit has an issue. Not that the current is not getting bigger, not that the R0 is not very really high. In this case, the R0 will be high and the current will be a better If the current will get bigger in a better way with, uh, had this Casper transistor not been there. But the issue is, if I have to find out what is the minimum voltage V0 can be, can go to, why is keeping all transistors in saturation? What will your answer be? What is the minimum voltage V0 can go to? Let's say some circuit is attached to it, right? Something is attached here. I need to find out what is the minimum voltage that V0 can go to. What is that voltage? I know this voltage. So this voltage has to be one threshold voltage below VGS1 plus VGS2, right? So essentially this is VGS1 plus VGS2 minus one threshold voltage. Okay. okay. So if I write it in terms of overdrives and threshold voltages, I have two threshold voltages here and two overdrives, right? So essentially this becomes one threshold voltage is canceled. So this becomes threshold voltage plus two overdrive. Right. So the issue is that in modern technology, we we deal with let's say one volt of uh, VDD. So threshold voltages, let's say it's the order of 400 millivolt. This is 0.4, and you keep like at least 100 millivolt of overdrive. So this becomes 200 millivolt. So 0.6 volt simply goes in biasing. If you are dealing with one volt supply and one six volt goes in biasing, then you don't have to do for the circuit on top, whatever was you are supposed to make, right? So, so this becomes a problem, but this is not a problem if, if we had only a single transistor. If we had a single tran transistor and this was biased at VGS1 and this were V0, this minimum could have been V overdrive, right? So, this minimum could have been only. 0.1 volt, right? So the cost that we pay by putting Casper transistor one on top of each other is this: we lose swing limits, right? We lose swing limits, right? So tomorrow's class we'll see how can we modify this architecture while retaining all the good things about mirroring and high impedance and all, but maybe not lose so much of voltage. Okay. Okay. Thank you.